out of Hebrews chapter 11, 24 through 29. It's a story of Moses, story of his life, how he walked with God. And through his walk with God in his life, Moses takes eight steps throughout his life that, um, that teach us about change and how God traumatically changed not just Moses' life, but millions of people that he touched, praise the Lord. And uh, God worked through him to bring great change through their life. So how to change? We began our series with step or change number one, which was faith, by faith. Uh, Moses, when, and the scripture says, Hebrews 11, 24 through 29, by faith. Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ to be greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect for the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the Pharaoh, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn in Egypt should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as if by dry land, which the Egyptians attempting to do were drowned. There's eight steps in there for change, or eight changes, progressive change, path of change. We start with faith, change, or step number one. We're going to look at the next two this morning, refused. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, but choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. So choosing and refusing is step two and three. Let me just talk about <clears throat> the concept of change for just a moment. Change for the better, change that is, that is vertical change, change that truly elevates and advances us, is God's greatest gift to the world. Think about it. The ability to break loose from bondage, to escape captivity, to rebound from failure, to rise up and become a better person. All of those changes are changes that the Father sent Jesus into the world to give to you. Glory to God. Breaking loose of bondage, escaping captivity, rebounding from failures, and rising to be a better person. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus said, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. You know, when people see Jesus who is the light of the world, you know what that light does to them? It immediately makes clear and it rises within their heart the hope for change. That's what the light of the world wins. People saw Jesus, the hope for change that they had lost hope in was reignited within them. However, Satan, throughout history, knowing how that our slavery to sin made us desperate for change. Humanity has struggled. Struggled, picture somebody being hit and knocked down and they're in the dirt and they're just out of it and they can't get back to their feet. That's what humanity's been like since sin's punch hit us. It's made us desperate for change and we have struggled and we've shifted and moved around but we've never gotten back to our feet until true change came through Jesus who lifted us up, put us back on our feet, praise the Lord. And so because Satan knows that we're desperate for change, he used the promise of change to lure, trap, and to drain people of hope in the human race. You know, from Nimrod to Obama, Satan has used master manipulators to draw and lure people away from God, away from the true source of hope with promises of fake change. Everyone say fake change. We're all familiar with the term fake news, but I want to talk this morning about fake change. Because Satan uses fake change to keep people from looking away 
from the Nimrods and from the Obamas and for all the rest of those people who sell changes that they themselves have never experienced, sell change that they have never completed in their lives. You know, the disciples were astonished when Jesus said to them and told them that trusting in the world system of wealth was an obstruction to entering the kingdom of God. They were shocked. They were amazed. They, they were um, uh, more than disappointed. They couldn't believe it, that everything that they had worked for and their, their parents before them and their parents before them and everyone in society worked towards, if I work hard and enter the world system, the, the system of wealth, and I put my trust in that, life's going to get better, I'm going to move forward, true change will take place. But Jesus said, putting your trust in the, the change of the world will literally hinder you from entering the kingdom of God. You can't serve two masters. It's pretty plain. True change cannot occur until you stop trusting fake change. In fact, in Mark chapter 10, verse 26 and 27, is the account of, of him telling them basically that when he says they were greatly astonished when he said how hard it is for those that trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. And uh, they said, who then can be saved? Who could be saved? And Jesus said, well, with men it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So he reignites their hope. He first destroys their hope in the change that the world offers. He says, if you trust that change, it's impossible for you to enter the kingdom of God. You can never really change that way. But with God, all things are possible. Jesus' cross, with its vertical beam and its horizontal beam, is literally, it is the symbol of true change because the horizontal change that we hope for rests upon the vertical change that alignment with Jesus' kingdom produces in your life. In other words, God will add horizontal results to your vertical change. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all this will be added. So that vertical change becomes the, the support. God wants to meet the needs of your body, your soul, your mind, your life, your family, your material needs. He wants to bless. And he has shown throughout history that um, he is not the least bit afraid of blessing people and them, them losing um, their love for him because he's blessed them. The vertical change in you is what the horizontal change rests upon. Just Think about it. It's a simple formula. But those changes in your circumstances, changes in the material world around you, rest upon the vertical change that must take place within you. That's why in 2 Corinthians, God instructs Paul to say, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, the new has come. So the new has come with its improvement to your circumstances, with the blessings God wants to bring you, with the horizontal change, the new comes. But what, what's it predicated upon? What, what starts, what supports that new coming? If anyone is in Christ, the vertical change. Your answers are in your relationship with Jesus. God deeply desires. He's not just willing. I want you to leave here today knowing that God's not just willing to bless you and make your horizontal life one that reflects the goodness and the prosperity of God, but he is desirous. He is desirous that you are a testament to his blessing. And I know you're thinking, well, then why does he keep letting me go through trials? Because God deeply desires to bring change for the better to your life. And he's not hiding that change from you. He's revealing that change in you. That's why he says, Behold, the new has come. Oh, when you're in Christ, 
Old things pass away. Behold. What does behold mean? It means look. What Jesus is saying, he's saying, when you are in Christ, I want you to look and understand that the path of change is now within you and you can enter it and take its steps. So the changes that God wants to bring in our life they come through our relationship with Jesus. The more we put into our relationship with Him, the more those changes, those improvements in our condition, those results begin to show up. Is there a struggle? Is there a battle? Is there resistance? Of course there's resistance. The enemy resists anybody who is in Christ, but greater is he is in us than he that is in the world. We defeat him by leaning in to our relationship with Christ. So Moses' life reveals eight steps of transforming change, eight changes. We shared faith as that beginning step, praise the Lord. But step two, or change two, is a negative one. It's called refusing. It says that by faith, when he was come to years, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So that next step, that next change, refusing, is a negative one. And Moses' change began by refusing to continue in his current identity and his current condition. That was the first change that took place in his life. Let me put it to you like this. You're not ready to get married until you're done being single. So you must refuse. You must come to the point where you're saying, I refuse to be identified as, you know, the son of Pharaoh's daughter because I'm wanting something else. God doesn't just add the blessings that he wants us to choose to our life where we're at. He has to move us out. There's a refusing that... that precipitates our choosing. So God doesn't just change you. He calls you into change. I think some people get dis, um, disappointed when they get saved because they're expecting this sort of miraculous renovation. I'm, I'm just going to be a total, I'm going to be somebody else. I'm going to have a different life. And God wants you to be not somebody else, but he wants you to be that person that you were brought into this world to be. Um, you know, but the world's had its effect upon you. So he leads you or he calls you into the path of change. God always calls people out of where they are so that he can bring them in to where he wants them to be. That's exactly what it said in the Old Testament about the slaves in Egypt. It says God brought them out so that he might bring them in. They couldn't enter the promised land in Egypt because guess what? The promised land wasn't in Egypt. The promised land was somewhere else, so he had to get them out of Egypt. And the familiar tra trappings and trimmings of what is familiar to you physically, materially, emotionally, mentally, sometimes you have to depart from that. You have to refuse that so that God can bring you in to what he has for you. Everyone who walked, through God, walked with God through the Bible experienced this. Abraham left his home and his father's house among the Chaldeans, traveled some 700 and something odd miles to the west, the Bible says, not knowing where he was going. He didn't know where he was going, but he was following God. But he, his, his journey began by refusing to live any longer among the Chaldeans. David David left as a young man. He left his father's house, went to the courts of King Saul, then left the courts of King Saul, lived in the cave of Adullam. He spent years leaving, refusing to be what he had been so that he might become what God wanted him to be. The disciples, when Jesus called them, the first thing he called them was out of their fishing jobs, out of their careers, out of their homes. Think about it. Throughout the Bible, everyone who has come to a place where they, where they meet God had to leave the place, leave the conditions, leave the identity that they previously had held. 
At 17 years old, I left my home, I left my mother, I left my job, I left my school. Literally just didn't show up, just said, I'm, I'm leaving to go follow Jesus. That's a radical story for another time. But my whole life began by refusing to stay in the place where I was, and I went to find and follow Jesus. I knew a guy that, that I played music with for years who was just one of the, be the best bass player I'd ever played with. He was great. He had played with a number of different groups, Aretha Franklin, Tower of Power, um, the Isley Brothers. The guy was just good. And his testimony, the Lord had been dealing with him, calling him, but he was wrestling with that call. That call was there and he felt it. And so one night when he was playing with a band down in New York City, on stage in the middle of playing, he couldn't take it anymore. The, the call of God made him refuse. And in the middle of the song, he unplugged his bass and walked off stage and never went back in the middle of the song. Refusing. We, Christianity begins with refusing. Like I said, you're not ready for marriage if you're not finished being single. Refusing is basically a call from God. It's not a religious act. You can't put it on. You can't go and deny yourself a whole bunch of stuff, and then God's going to go, okay, wow, you're ready. It, refusing is not just um, arbitrarily picking things that you want to quit doing or retreat from. It's specifically God calling you. You know what you're supposed to refuse. God will call you. He'll call you out of it. And you'll, by him doing that, you're responding to him and not just conducting some kind of a religious act. Um, refusing is your voluntary choice. God will never force it on you. Some people say, well, the Lord smashed my car so that I could do this. God destroyed this so that I... No. God is always going to leave the refusing up to you. It's a choice you must make. Refusing is disassociating with your familiar identity. Are you willing to stop trying to be the image in your mind that since before you were saved, you had up in your head? It's your default image. This is what I am. This is who I am. This is how I act. This is how I speak. If you truly want change, you have to begin by refusing. Refusing to hold stubbornly onto those characteristics that are just typical of you. Now, that doesn't mean God necessarily is going to banish them out of your life. But in each of these examples I've shared with you, the refusing was a dramatic step. And some of you are being beaten by your own stubbornness. You're stubbornly willful, and you don't want to give up. You're entrenched. This is the way I am. I'm this kind of a person disassociating with your familiar identity. Can you change yourself? No, but at least you can stop insisting that this is the way I am. So God can do something with you. And finally, before we go to change number three, refusing is the prelude to choosing. You're not ready to choose the call. Choose what God has for you until you have refused to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So <clears throat> call number three, or uh, excuse me, change number three, step number three is choosing. It says he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Could you think with me what it must have been like for Mo Moses who was raised in the court of the greatest emperor on the face of the earth at that time, the Pharaoh of Egypt, as Pharaoh's daughter's son, or basically the son of Pharaoh, if you will, um, even though he was technically a stepson. But he was raised with all of that privilege. And it says he chose rather to be associated with the people of God. Well, the people of God didn't go to megachurches in those days. The people of God were the slaves paving the roads and doing the work, picking up the garbage and building the pyramids in Egypt. And so he goes from Pharaoh's court to associating with the slaves. And it was his choice. He chose to do that. So God moves on Moses to refuse Pharaoh's court 
Why? Now Moses doesn't know this, but because the burning bush, which one day he is going to come in contact with, is never going to show up in the court of Pharaoh. It's somewhere else that Moses hasn't been to yet. And he's nev he'll never get there to be able to choose it until first he has left where he was at. Choosing rather to suffer the affliction with God's people than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Do you know that Moses chose to step down from being celebrated to being humiliated with God's people? That's not a choice most of us would make. Most of us, what's the saying they love to hear, you know, um, that you hear all the time, God's giving me an upgrade or, you know, we're stepping up and, and everything is upward mobility. But when you read the Bible, God's call usually doesn't begin with upwardly mobile changes. He steps from being envied and celebrated to being humiliated and being an outcast. So the most important changes in life that we're going to make, they're usually unappealing and, and often difficult. They're hard. They're not changes. If, if, you, if, if uh, you told people, well, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing to be among the slaves, are you crazy? And we think, how can I lead people to Jesus if I'm telling them I'm willing to be among the slaves? Who would want that life? But still, we have to follow Jesus. And, and speaking of follow Jesus, think about it. Jesus comes into the world, the King of glory, King of kings, Lord of lords, creator of the universe, sustainer of all things. Where is he born? He's born in the, in the five-star Marriott? No. Where is he raised? He's raised in the, in the best castles, the courts? No. He's born in a manger. He's camped out in a tent in the woods. He's traveling around, doesn't own a bed, doesn't own a, a, a home, even after 29 years, and he's calling his disciples, he says, I don't have a place to lay my head. And uh, so even our Lord, he brought about the greatest change and the way to change for, uh, uh, in all of human history. And yet he himself did not pursue the world's changes, the world's ability to advance because he was looking to help us to advance to God's heavenly standards. So <clears throat> we know and we need those changes that are hard. Wise people know that the, that the most important changes um, to choose, the best changes to choose are oftentimes hard. Um, but they have to be made. Those decisions have to be made. Uh, rather than simply drifting towards what is appealing. Hebrews chapter 12, the first two verses. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all people who experienced the change of God in their life, but refused and then chose and walked that walk, it says we're surrounded by a great cloud of heavenly witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. There's the refusing. We want advancement, but God can't add blessing, can't add blessing if we're holding on to the things that were the false change in our life. Uh, you may need the Lord to help you let go of them, but there's got to be a willingness, Lord, I want to let go of this. So laying aside the every weight and the sin that clings so closely, you know, I want to talk for just a second, the sin that cling so closely. How do you know which sin that is? It's the one that you're blind to. It's the one that you tell yourself, that's not really a sin. That's just me. That's part of me. That's the way it is. But it is a weight that's been holding you back. It's, it's something that has been fighting against the change in your life that you really need. So that change that you really need in your life is trying to come, but maybe you need to go to God and say, what am I holding on to that is false change that I need to lay upon the altar, and he'll help you get there. So laying aside 
uh, the, the weight and the sin that clings so easily. Let's run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So notice that Jesus chose the cross. He refused the life of the elite. He chose to be effective for God, living the life that he lived. And as a result, he chose the cross. Who would choose the cross? Remember Moses chose to be humiliated with the slaves of Egypt, but through that choice, he eventually stands before the burning bush and is brought back to Egypt as the deliverer of those slaves and to lead them into the promised land. But Jesus ourself, uh, Jesus himself rather, he, he despises the shame of the cross, but he chooses it. Why? Because of the joy that is set before him. He's going for a prize, and that prize is through the cross. He must go through that cross. He chooses to go through the cross because the change that it will bring to the human race. It will cause people who have nothing but false change and living hopeless. It will bring hope and the reality of true transformation to their lives. So Jesus chose the cross to provide our resurrection. And if we avoid the cross of change in our own lives... We miss the resurrection. We have to walk in his shoes. We walk in his, his path. So the greatest changes come by choosing what we need rather than just what we want. I'll close with this verse. Romans 8, 16 through 19 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if we are the children of God, then we are heirs namely heirs of God and also fellow heirs with Christ. For if indeed we suffer with him, we will also be glorified with him. For I consider that our present sufferings cannot even be compared to the coming glory that will be revealed in us. For the whole creation eagerly waits for the revelation, the manifestation of the sons of God. So we are refusing the fake change of the world. We are choosing the path of the cross, the path of Christ. Why? Because we, we're martyrs. We like being martyrs. No, we see a greater glory before us. And the reality is that the whole creation is in travail right now. They don't realize it. But what they are agonizing over is to see the people of God the sons of God rise up. That is the hope of the world. That's why Jesus said, Jesus, the light of the world, said, you are the light of the world. Hallelujah. So we begin by faith, and in faith we refuse. We make those choices, and then we choose, even though those choices may look unpopular, may make us look foolish. We make those choices because that's what leads to the burning bush that's what leads to the parting of the Red Sea. That's what leads to entering the promised land. It's a path of change. It is a series of changes. It's not just magic poof and all of a sudden things are good. So if you want the horizontal benefits, work on that vertical relationship because that's what supports all those changes that God wants to make around you. He makes them in you. Close your Bible and stand with me this morning.